Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Welcome everyone to the episode Clearing Clutter. It's springtime, the perfect time to release all this stuff from our lives. And our guest today is Star Hansen, a clutter whisperer, a certified professional organizer. If you are feeling like a hot mess, she's the person for you. If you can relate, please stay tuned. You'll hear what's at the root of our clutter tendencies, how to heal your relationship with clutter, and how we might be able to clear the chaos to unlock your greatest potential. And why, if you can relate, the clutter is actually proof of your genius. Star is the author of the book, Why the uh, explicit, explicit, explicit. I'm not sure if I can say that and say it's clean for all the all the podcast places. So we'll leave that out. I'm still not organized. Welcome, Star. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. And yes, the title of my book. When I came up with it, I, I, I chose Why the F Am I Still Not Organized because I thought that's what people come to me saying. They're like, why is this not working? But I it didn't I didn't forward think enough to think about when people, when I have to say it from the stage, when I do keynote speeches or podcasts. And I love the audio book because what we just did, my producer was amazing. He just bleeped out the word. Like it's yeah. because the word is like an insignificant. It's like, sometimes I say why in the world, if I have to speak for people who are very offended by the F bomb. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's <laughs> we find a way around, but it was more about expressing the sentiment of this frustration of why is it that I've done so many things and I'm so competent in so many areas of my life and why won't yeah. the clutter go away? I just don't get it. And that's what I wanted to answer is that question. Well, it's uh, exactly what your uh, people are asking you for. We just have to let all the organizations and Google know when we're up low, YouTube know when we're up low. Yeah, this is clean content. <laughs> it is clean. I know. I don't even cuss in the book. And I don't, you know, it's, it's, there's just interesting punctuation instead of the word. It's fine. Exa- no, I think it's brilliant. But anyway, so now you have it, listeners. So thank you. Before we dive into the world of clutter, I have to say, I so appreciated your TEDx talk. Thank you. And how you listen to the clutter. But there's a lot more going on when you tune into the clutter. I mentioned grief, but you can take it further when you go into somebody's house. Oh, yes. I, I, you know, I say in the TEDx talk, I can walk into your house and with a single glance, know the state of your life. And I know that that will exclude me from many dinner invitations, but <laughs> it's, it's a, a powerful skill to walk in and be able to see the way that we talk to ourselves and the way we talk to each other through our physical objects. And what I work with specifically is people with recurring clutter, the clutter that continues to show up over and over again. And when we are having that experience, we are really in this deeper relationship with ourselves through the physical stuff. And that's Mm -hmm. what I help people to understand. Brilliant. And does the stuff talk to you? As you allude to in the TEDx talk. Well, you know, when, when you walk into someone else's house, or even if you're talking to a friend and they're sharing their problems and they might Mm -hmm. feel like they're up against a wall and they don't understand what's happening, it's so easy from the outside in a non-involved way to see the truth of what's happening. And I think that's part, like I do have 
over 20 years of experience doing this. And this is one of the gifts that I came here to share with people. And I think it's always easier to look at someone else's clutter from the outside and understand what's going on because I'm not emotionally triggered by it. I can just, when I walk into your house, I don't see the chaos. I'm not looking and discovering that there's something wrong with you or that you're defective. I am seeing the beautiful facets of your life. I'm seeing the incredible nuances of the beautiful being you are. And the clutter is just a, a part of it. It was just a like a little a little thing that's going on. And I can track what's happening. And I think mostly because I don't have this deep emotional need for things to be different than they are. I can really lean into what they are. Okay. So it sounds almost as if you meet the people at the emotional level that they're at rather than seeing the clutter and going, okay, we need to put this over here and we need to have bring in the recycling bins and put it over there and put it. No, that's not what you, it sounds like I you do, do both. Yeah. So yeah? What, what I do is, so I always tell people it's so important to know how to organize before you can discover the deeper meaning of your stuff. If you don't okay. know how to organize, it's too easy to feel like that's the reason why you're disorganized. And so um, your listeners can download, I have 10 steps for how to organize anything. They can download it at organizingiseasy.com. And that will basically, you know, most people truthfully are doing most of the 10 steps. They just might be missing one or two. And so we're often not off base, but we need to know how to organize. So I use the vehicle of organization to elicit a deeper spiritual, emotional healing through the physical clutter. Okay. And I believe when we were having our conversation before this interview, we or I had mentioned, in my experience, behind a lot of it is grief and trauma. Is that your experience? Absolutely. It's very, very normal for parts of our lives to affect us so deeply that we get a little stuck. Either maybe we can't let go of certain things or we feel like we don't know how to you know, move beyond certain things that have happened to us. And you can really see that in the layers of spaces. I remember working with a gentleman when we were moving him into assisted living and in his office, there was this very clear line from 2002. And I said to him, how interesting what happened in 2002. And he said, that's when my wife died. And you could oh. see that's when his world stopped and he wasn't able to function the way he had. It was almost like clarity systems, you know, peace. And then mm. 2002, and then it was just chaos because this man was trying to figure out how to live after this person that he had spent 50 plus years with was gone. Oh. Yeah. And how were you able to work with him? Can you, you don't have to go into details, but where did, where would you start? Well, in that case, it's tricky because he was moving into assisted living. And when you're in that situation, you are very limited in what you can bring with you. And so in a case like that, what I tell people to do is shop from your home, meaning go through your home and pick out, cherry pick the items that you want to bring with you into the next life. So instead of decluttering, like most of us think of doing, we're like, I've got to go in and do the hard work and purge all this stuff. That was not the journey for him. He needed to go mm -hmm. in. He went through, he took the things that were relevant to him and he took those to his new place. His children came through. They did a sweep of the space in the same way. Okay. And then they asked me to come in and just get rid of the rest. It was, so mm -hmm. there's ways where I think a lot of the conversation around organizing seems like I've got to dig in and face the hard stuff. And Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's let's just build a new life and release the rest. And so that was mm. that was what we did for him. And he was fine with that. And I would imagine he would have taken pieces that reminded him of his wife and their their life together. Yeah, you know, it's if you have a shopping list from your loved one in their handwriting, it feels so precious, so precious when you see it mm. and you want to hold on to it. But the truth is you don't need a shopping list. You might want the love letter they wrote you three months into your relationship. You might want the last Valentine's Day card. And 
And that's one of the hard things is when we are, when everything is important, nothing is important. And so this idea of shopping through our stuff, even is really relevant when someone you love passes away. You know, Mm -hmm. I always say, I like to have a box of memorabilia from the person who passed and it's like visiting them. It's a visitation. When I go into the boxes Mm -hmm. of the people who I've done this for on their anniversary, on their birthday, on major holidays, I feel like I'm reconnecting with them in a profound way. And it, Let's it lets a couple of things happen. One, it creates the sacred space for us to continue to evolve our relationship. And two, it keeps those items from being spread out among the rest of my items, acting like landmines that can just kind of annihilate my day just because mm-hmm. I'll come across something really painful or sentimental yeah. or emotional when I wasn't expecting to. Yeah. So through the clutter the emotions of grief and trauma are talking to you. You can see it. Oh, very much so. And you can tell by the way, if you go to start organizing something and you feel stuck, if you feel or terrified, I have a a free download for people on my website about, you know, how to know if clutter is talking to you. It's often, it's terrifying for people. It's like they, they might even know what's in there and they're not ready to face it. And so there's not a human on this planet who doesn't have some level of trauma and we don't have to compare traumas. Everybody's, you know, you can drown in an inch of water and you can drown in an ocean and all that matters is that you drown. And we have to be really compassionate with ourselves and be kind and loving to the spaces in our lives where we feel a little lost or broken or damaged or, you know, just a little bit in chaos and be really gentle. Yeah. So you go into somebody's house where you suspect a death, but they may not have mentioned it, but you sense it. How do you work the conversation around to begin to sort of sort things out in their lives? I'm very blunt. I I am very blunt. (laughs) Well, it's, you know, a lot of through the years, people have said, oh, why wouldn't you become a therapist? You're so, you know, you're, you help me in ways my therapist can't. And I say, I don't like the rules of having to operate within a construct where I can't share my personal experience or I can't go there with you in really deep ways. I don't want it to be a one hour in and out session. And I like, I love my therapist. I love the therapist I've worked with. It's amazing. But what what I'm doing is when I go into people's homes, they're letting me into things that they don't share with their spouses or their best mm-hmm. friends or their yeah. kids. Or so it's sacred. And you kind of there's that saying, pray for a stranger, because who am I? I don't have an impact on your life. You can tell mm-hmm. me everything you ever did that you think makes you a horrible person. And I'm gonna just hold space and love you and not mm-hmm. judge you. That's mm-hmm. that's my job. That's my presence. And So when I go in, if I do notice that there might have been a loss, I am the blunt person who will say, have you experienced any losses? Is there any, any, anything that I need to know that would make our experience better or easier? Is there any kind of, you know, anything medically you want to share with me or about Mm -hmm. any losses? I'll just, I don't come out and say, do you have ADHD? Do you have a dead relative? I, you know, even if I'm seeing symptoms, I let them come to me, but I open the door and sometimes people will share right away. Sometimes they may not share for months and that's their prerogative because this is our personal journey and we get Mm -hmm. to do it on our own terms. But I like them to know that being really frank is welcome with me and they don't have to, you know, and I, and often when I work with someone I lead with, if I'm doing my job right, you'll probably want to punch me in the face at least once. I say, (laughs) I don't recommend it. I look little, but I am raised from a ranch and I'm stronger than you think, but more than that, like you're going to have that moment if I'm doing my job right, because I'm going to be walking with you through some of the most painful things in your life and the things that you've been working hard to ignore. And people Mm -hmm. always say the same thing. Star, I'd never feel like that about you. You're just so lovely. I could. (laughs) And then somewhere in our journey together, I'll ask them to do something and they'll give me that look. And I'm like, you're feeling it now, aren't you? (laughs) You know, (laughs) They're like, I didn't think it would happen. And I was like, because, and I don't take it personally because it's, it's not about me. Yeah. It's not about me. I'm yeah. here for your highest good. I'm here to hold space and support you. I'm a safe person. You get to rail around and be frustrated and scared and overwhelmed and hate what I'm asking you to do. And I will tell you, 
I'm not going to make you do something you're not ready for. I'm not going to force yeah. you. This is your journey. I think of myself as an expression or an, I'm sorry, an extension of you. I am a tool that you have hired and contracted to come and help you create change. And sometimes you need to put the hammer down. Sometimes you need a break. And we kind of, we want to really honor your journey mm-hmm. and what's going on for you. Oh, it sounds like you have a beautiful um, arrangement with your your clients because you're able to be, I, I wouldn't say blunt, but you're forthright. You're yeah. setting parameters and boundaries around what you're going to help them do. And it's okay if you feel this way and want to punch me. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's the funny thing is, and this is like not always about grief, but there's what I call the last box theory. And if you have a lot of paperwork in your house and paperwork's been an emotional thing for you to go through, what I notice is that when we get down to the last box, you will never see a more ornery, ready to fight person than the person organizing their last box. It is, even though it's what they (laughs) want to do, and this is where you can really see that clutter is doing something for us, where it's hard for us to release that attachment and hard for us to really remove that. I had a client who we were organizing her office and we organized the whole room. And at the end, there was just this one box and, and she said, I'm not ready to go through it. And I said, no problem. So we didn't go through it. And we just put it in the closet. There was room for it. It was a box of paperwork to sort. So it was organized enough. And we walked away a year later. She had me come back because the office clutter had all completely returned and expanded. So we did the same thing. We organized. And at the end, there was the same box And she said, once again, I don't want to do it. And I said, no problem. Because again, I'm here for you. So we didn't. Six months later, I come back. That box is still there. And now the clutter has come back. So this time I said, let's talk about this box. And the box was filled with stuff from her dad's death. It was really hard for her to face. And we processed through it. We kind of talked it out and she went through it. It took her less than 30 minutes. It was a lot easier than she thought. The idea was, I mean, it wasn't joyful. She wouldn't want to go back and do it again, but she did it. And the office clutter went away and has been gone for over 10 years. And she was not enjoyable during that experience. She wasn't like, this is my favorite. I love you, Star. You know, it was like, she was cranky and irritated and agitated. She didn't want to do it. And she was on rave. And I get it. And she is allowed to be that. I don't, I don't expect you to be happy to have to walk through your own personal hell. I don't expect, I don't need you to be a certain way for me. I need you to be whatever you are and I'm going to hold space for you and just be a part of your journey while you walk through that challenge. So interesting. So it was almost as if by, it was in a box and her emotions were in the box, Yes. but the clutter kept piling up. Is that how we protect our boxes, box of pain? (laughs) Yeah. So there's many ways we use our clutter. We might use it as a communication with ourselves as like a reminder, right? The, The bill on the desk is a reminder to pay it. The weights on the living room floor, a reminder to work out. We might use it as a protection, right? To insulate ourselves from painful emotional things. We might use it for security. You see this during like the pandemic, for example, where everybody had a hundred pounds of, you know, rolls of toilet paper just in case. And, (laughs) you know, it's like, it makes us feel like I'm going to be safe if I have these things or I'm keeping it just in case. There's several ways we use clutter and for sure insulating ourselves against that. I call it I refer to this clutter as activated versus practical clutter. So activated clutter are highly charged emotional items that we don't want to deal with, that feel like they might destroy us, things that just feel too big to manage. And practical clutter is just stuff. It's just stuff that finds its way because you're busy and you don't have time to deal with it, or you get too much of something when someone gifts you something, like whatever it is, it's just an excess of stuff. There's no emotions around it. But what happens is, is that we will use that practical clutter to hide our activated clutter. And so that's where it's tricky because you'll look at your clutter and say, this shouldn't be so hard. It's just, it's just stuff. And Mm. when it feels really hard, it's because there may only be two or five activated items in a big box of stuff, but that's enough to kind of infuse the other items with that energy and make you feel repelled to touch it. Okay. And I would imagine until you start talking to them, Star, that people have no awareness of why. You know, 
it's, it used to be that way. It, I used to it have did. to be very covert about this because, you know, who wants to be welcome someone in their house that's like, let me help you see what your clutter's saying to you. <laughs> like they don't want to hear it. They certainly don't want me to hear it. So it, but I think the last few years, people are much more open. So where before this was not even part of their conversation between the book that I wrote and the TEDx talk and my videos and my resources online, people now show up to my, you know, my online membership or my classes. And they say, I'm using my clutter to protect myself from, you know, my husband or what <laughs> they come in and they know what's going on. Like I'm using my clutter to help hold on to my mom who passed away. And, and so it really is interesting now. And I think people, one of the greatest things that I hear when I start this work with people is oh, that makes so much sense. I mean, I, look, I'm not a magician. I'm not pulling something out of the ethers here. I'm seeing what exists in your life. And the minute that you have a safe person to reflect it back to you, oftentimes it's a very short journey between not having any idea of why our clutter's here and completely getting the journey. And the challenge mm -hmm. is not seeing what it's doing. The challenge comes from being present while we have our own journey with it. You don't see what you're, how you're using your clutter and then instantly it goes away because just mm -hmm. like our lessons that we learn in life, it takes a while. Sometimes that acknowledgement that you miss your mom, you may not want to put the stuff away. You might notice, oh, wow, I'm holding onto this stuff to keep me connected to my mom. I can't deal with it. And just, but knowing it starts to invite in, and this is where I take people, how do we get you a better, more straight through mm -hmm. version of that? Like if you are keeping stuff to stay connected to your mom, can we build an altar to your mom? Can you start to wear mm -hmm. some of her clothes so you can feel her holding you? Can yeah. you, you know, instead of keeping things stuck in a box where you're never going to see them again and you just know that they're there, it makes you feel better. What if you start to invite her into your life more specifically? What if you start a journal where you write your mom love letters in that journal mm -hmm. of telling her what's happening in your life? And once we start to really meet the need that the clutter has been serving, the clutter then just feels like it melts away because it's yeah. serving a purpose. And if we get that need met without the clutter, the clutter is not necessary anymore. Mm, wonderful. So we're talking about clutter, but underneath there's the grief element. Yes. Um, and we've both worked, as you've mentioned, with people who are having to deal with the sorting out of it. When we were talking, you mentioned that going into homes either where there's a lot of clutter or then our absence of clutter. Can you share that journey? Because to me, that was pretty poignant. And I'm sure a number of our listeners may even re uh, relate to that moment as well. I think a lot of people worry that when they die, they're going to be a burden to their loved ones with the volume of stuff that they have. And you see shows and books like Swedish Death Cleaning and things that address that head on of how do you pare down and make, it's essentially how do you make peace with your life and release the items so your loved ones don't have to do it. And it's beautiful. And what I was sharing before is you see, there are times where, you know, I see a lot of people who for 10, 20, 30 years before their death, they're working hard to try to pare down. I had one client who told me that their mother was so intentional about paring down before she passed away that she had gotten rid she like was going through and purging everything. And she got rid of the last drawer of paperwork the day before she died. And so she left her house like completely neutral for her family. It was just like the dream everyone dreams of. How do I not be a, you know, quote unquote burden to my family? But there's another side of that too. And that's the side of a, a lack of stuff. And most people think of clutter and they think, oh, it's just too much stuff. And the truth is that, you know, for some people, like I was talking about certain people who might have suicide, suicide ideations, mm -hmm. if they have suicidal ideations, sometimes people in that case want to erase themselves. And so you see people will sometimes get rid of everything they own before they die, not as a service to their loved ones, but because they're just trying to wipe the slate clean. And mm -hmm. it's really, but you see that also when people are living, it's not just in death. And that's, when you walk into someone's home where there's nothing, that's mm -hmm. as haunting as walking into a giant storage unit of stuff, except that the, the pain is not stuff to go through. The pain is emotional and the depth of having to deal with that. But I see this also with people 
in their homes. You might have one person who has tons of clutter and chaos and the other person is nowhere to be seen. It's like, they're like a wallflower. They just barely have anything. They try to stay invisible. And for me, that's as much of a story as someone who has an excess Mm -hmm. of stuff. A lack of stuff is as much telling about what you're going through as having an excess would. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting because you hear stories of people who are now purchasing containers outside of their home to create, you know, to carry their stuff. And I often think of, you mentioned the Swedish death cleaning and can't for the life of me pronounce the word, but it is a thing where people do pare down. And I cannot imagine what it'll be like for the loved ones of these people that insist on having spending a fortune to have this container full of their stuff. Oh, it's, I'm sure. it's, in, it's very intense. And it's, you see families torn apart by having to navigate that. You see families okay. going broke from having to navigate that. It is, it's very, very intense. You've got kids going through it, trying to make time during their already busy day. You, I mean, it's, it's wonderful if you can hire someone and just kind of make it go away. But the problem with this is when someone dies, our emotional connection to that stuff goes through the roof. And so Mm -hmm. you may not want a stranger going through stuff. You want to do it yourself. You want to know your parent better by going through it. You want to see what was so important and special that they felt the need to keep it and pay $400 a month to keep it. And so it, it raises the, the urgency, I guess. And And it can be, I mean, yes, there's ways like the first house I ever organized or the first room I ever organized was when I was in high school and my grandfather passed away. And while my family did the funeral arrangements, I organized his room. And that was a very beautiful and interesting experience for me because I hadn't known him much when he was alive. Mm -hmm. We lived in another city and, and I got to know him through organizing his stuff. And so there's such beautiful connection through the organization of people's stuff. And we want that experience. We want that connection. But when you're looking at having two or three storage units, plus a garage and an attic, it does become a lot. And for some people who have that volume of stuff, you know, there could be something like hoarding disorder that's connected. And then that's not just having too much stuff. That's not living in a consumer driven society. That's someone who needs mental health support. And Mm -hmm. it's not about purging stuff. If you go and get rid of someone's stuff who has hoarding disorder, they're going to reclutter and gain more clutter after they do that. They're going to expand by 30%, I think is the statistic. And so, mm -hmm. and so that's why we don't get rid. I mean, it's one of the many reasons we don't purge for other people because it's so personal and it's such a violation, but it's, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And I think most people that I meet with who have a lot of clutter, they feel so guilty and ashamed of their clutter already. They have their family members telling them why they should be different and better and how to, Mm. how to do it. And I always say the best thing you can do for your loved ones is not to tell them they have a problem or tell them your advice about how they should solve the problem. The best thing that you can do is to get curious Tell me why, why holding on to all of these genes feels important to you. Tell me, and really like not to get them to get rid of it, but to really Mm -hmm. just be curious and hold space with them. Because if they don't feel threatened, if they don't feel bullied or ashamed about their stuff, they'll open up. And that's really what I do when I walk in. I get deeply curious about your relationship with stuff, the why you Mm -hmm. keep it, what you keep, where you keep it is very interesting to me. And people can feel that I don't have some agenda. I don't need you to get rid of more stuff. I just want to be here for your story. And if you can be that for your loved ones, it can be really, really helpful for them. Mm -hmm. So just getting curious, why do you have 30 pairs of jeans and just go silent and wait for the answer? Yeah. When, or you could say, when did you start collecting jeans? Do you remember? Did do jeans make you feel like happy when you have, like, I notice you have a lot of jeans, but you don't wear them. Does something stop you from wanting to wear them? Or does the collecting of, of those, you know, I had a client who had over 200 pairs of shoes and they were tags on them. And she said, I have no intention of wearing them, but they make me feel glamorous. Mm -hmm. And having a closet full of glamorous shoes felt great to her. And 
I mean, please, who am I, who am I to tell you that's wrong? Like, that's great. Like, you know, it's maybe that's something you need and, and you learn and you enrich the love that you have with people when you get curious rather than being in judgment about the state of their home and stuff. Yeah. Because they're already going there themselves. You've oh, mentioned yeah. they're already in that shame by the sounds of it. So what is our emotional relationship to our stuff? That's a great question. It's too big to answer. I'll just say it's, you know, it's <laughs> it's like saying, what is the emotional relationship we have with our emotions? It's, <laughs> I mean, it's so, I'm looking around my room and I see a light machine in the far corner. And it makes me feel tender in my heart because I think of my brother because he also likes that light machine. And I feel connected to him, even though we haven't, you know, it's like he's in a different state, but I look at that and I feel tender hearted. I look to my left and I see this beautiful red sarong that I wear with my dresses. And it reminds me of the summer I spent in Italy. I, I look at a book and I, and I think of the subject matter and it makes me feel stronger and more powerful. Every single object, I could name every single object in this room and I would have some sort of connection with it. And we don't often think about the details of our stuff. We just kind of, you know, it's like it almost fades into the background once we've been around it for a while. But we are impacted by the items that we keep around us, by the way we feel about the items. And again, nothing in here is particularly harrowing or deeply emotional. But I mean, my heart opened up three sizes just looking at that light and mm. thinking of my brother and how beautiful is that? You know, it's, but that's the the gift that our stuff provides for us is it gives us this visual, emotional, sensory connection to other people, places, and things. Okay. So it's almost as if each piece of stuff has a story. And a voice. I always say every object of stuff has a voice. And it's sometimes they're whispering to you. Sometimes they're singing to you. Sometimes they're screaming at you. Sometimes they're (laughs) shouting mean, evil chants at you. It's like they could be doing a lot of things. Yeah. But, and that's, I think the, the negative thing is what most people feel. They're like, oh, well, then my clutter must be telling me what a, you know, that I don't have my life together. And maybe, but it's also, if you stop, like God is in the details. If you stop and you look like I could look at, I'm in the middle of a move and I could stop and I could look and say, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. I still have to pack. Or I can Mm. look and be like, that's my brother right there. Like that's the summer I was in Italy and I had this beautiful Mm. romance and this like, ah, like, it's like, I get to choose whether I see it as a weight or if I see it as like a a kiss, a little moment into my Mm. life. And Mm. this is one of the things that they found in some of the studies that they've done around clutter, especially clutter with women is when we, because we, as women often feel like we, we are responsible for more of the household duties. That's just a societal, <laughs> just the thing. Yeah. We've just taken been gifted on. to us. Yeah. We no, <laughs> thank you, please. I'd like to return that gift. Um, but we, you know, we have this feeling. And so oftentimes we over identify with our stuff and what mm. the study has found because men don't, men don't per, like, I'm not saying all the time, but this is just like one study that I'm thinking of. And yeah. so the woman could go to work, the wife could go to work and she would feel like weighed down by the clutter and feel overwhelmed by it. And the husband goes to work and he feels fine. He's not thinking about it. He doesn't identify with it. And it's the long and the short of that study is clutter is only a problem. If you think it's a problem, like two people in the same home, both having very different experiences. The woman's cortisol is raised. She's in total stress and anxiety. The guy's like zippity doo da. Like it's like the, <laughs> yeah, it's like they're in the same house. They have the same responsibilities, right? It's like, but we over identify with it sometimes. And so I think it's just to remember that we get to choose to reclaim that. We get to choose to look around and kind of go into the details and say, okay, instead of looking at this as a task list. Can I find three things in this room that remind me of someone that I love? I can instantly do it. Can I look and find three things that make me feel excited about the ways that I'm growing in this life? Yes, I can. Like that, that slight reframe can shift how you look at your stuff and then how you start to engage in and with your objects as well. Mm, Wow. Very telling. Mystery solved. Why I haven't gotten rid of some of the kids' toys. (laughs) 
as a story. <laughs> yes. yes. And a connection. We feel often deeply connected to those parts of ourselves, those chapters of our lives or those people. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Worse. Oh. You can send me your, your bill. <laughs> I'll send an invoice. Yes. <laughs> My work go. here is done. <laughs> I mentioned to the listeners at the beginning that I wanted us to discuss a few things. The root of our clutter. We've mentioned a few things. What is the root of our clutter? If you have recurring clutter, clutter that keeps coming up, no matter how many times you work on it, that clutter is doing something for you. If you can figure out what your clutter is doing for you and get that need met more directly, the clutter will not be needed and it will I'm not saying magical fairies will come and remove it for you in the night. I'm just saying that when you address it after you have determined and met that need more directly, the clutter will feel like it falls away more effortlessly. It'll be easier to solve. You won't feel so weighed down by it. And the ways that we use our clutter are, you know, there's five main ways that we use our clutter. We use it as a communication. We use it as a connection to other people or times in our lives. Like we were just talking about with your, you know, the kids toys, we use it as a sense of security, meaning my needs are met. I am, I'm okay. I'm, I'm like full up. We use it for protection, right? There's, there's so many ways that we use our clutter and it's so beautiful and powerful. And again, if we look at our clutter as, sorry, and I can't tell if you can hear it. We have, I, where I live in the spring, it's so windy and I have trees outside of my window. So I can't tell if you can hear the large tree scraping across my window or not no I can't oh but good I'll I'm listen so glad. more intently now <laughs> no I'm just I was distracting me because I was like oh gosh it's me and my tree me and my tree um but when we when we can really get down to the the depth of what's really going on right like are we using our clutter to connect are we using it to communicate are we using it for assurance that we are have our needs met are we using it for protection like what are we doing with our clutter once we know that. And so, for example, if you are using those toys to stay connected to your kids, like the question would be, what is it connecting you to? Is it connecting you to your role as a mother, that time in your life, that innocence, those those humans and the way you want to stay connected, like you figuring out, okay, this is what it really does for me. Because it's not the Mm -hmm. same for everybody. Lots of people hold on to toys. So you addressing that and then it becomes can I meet that need in a way that's more direct, more effective Mm. than having things that are then cluttering my space and keeping me from having a home office, keeping me from having a podcast studio, keeping me from having a guest room where people can come and it like, right. We have to kind of look at that element of it. So when you say um, we use it as communication, can you give me a for instance, as oh, to yes. what it's communicating. So many things I have had. So there's, as I said before, leaving the weights on the living room floor is a communication with ourselves of don't forget to work out. Leaving mm-hmm. the bill on the dining room table, don't forget to pay this bill. It can be simple. The post-its around your computer, right? Simple things like that can just mm-hmm. be a reminder. But we also use it to communicate with other people. And so one example I shared in the TEDx story is the couple who we organized their kitchen. And at the very end of our day, we came across this little broken teacup and they exploded into this argument in front of me about whose fault it was that the teacup had been broken and they both blamed each other and hadn't been talking about it. And that cup had been there for a year. So for a year, they blamed each other non-verbally by leaving the cup out. Neither of them would touch it because they both didn't feel it was their responsibility. So the communication was, I'm not like his communication was you broke this. You need to do something about it. Her communication was I'm done cleaning up your messes. And, and that was big. That's because in relationships, you know, it's, it's so cute when we get married and we're like, till death do you part. And it's like, ah, so sweet. Oh, but your romantic partner provides you with some of the most torturous, but wonderful things. And you evolve as a person a hundred times in that relationship and that marriage and that connection. And so that was them make, like they were literally changing the rules of their dynamic through that teacup. And because they were able to track what was going on and start to shift, they both made pretty drastic changes in their lives that made their relationship better and more like manageable mm-hmm. for them and also mm-hmm. made their own journeys better and more rich. And that's the beauty of paying attention to our clutter because the it, I could have seen that cup as, oh, look at them passive aggressively, not talking about it. 
but they were very much talking about it. They just didn't know how to have the words with each other. And the cup Mm. was a placeholder until they found those words. Mm, Beautiful. That just cycling back to uh, when you say you have people who are now uh, talking about this more readily, I wanted to say you've given them the languaging because really we've not had, we don't understand the language of clutter and wow. you're obviously giving us ways to be able to um, laugh about it rather than criticize it. And my train has just left the station again without me. <laughs> That's okay. We're here for it. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, I think that you're right. It's, there has not been this conversation and people are hungry for understanding the yes. why. And I do like to give words. Like I, I absolutely. And it's, it's, I think the hardest part for me has been to watch other organizers also, cause I'm used to being the only one talking about this. And now other organizers are talking about it, which is so beautiful. Like it's just, it's so inspiring and exciting for me to see that this is not just something that I am covertly doing in the shadows anymore, that people are responsive. They say, yes, please. Other organizers are, you know, I get messages like every day saying, oh my goodness, I'm using this with my clients now. And it's so helpful. And it really, really is beautiful to look at our stuff with curiosity, with love, with patience, without Mm -hmm. shame, without judgment to really say, tell me your story. And that's what we're doing through the process of clutter. It's not just tell me your story to the clutter. It's, I want to hear my own story. I want to hear your story. I want to be present with you as a human on your beautiful, imperfect journey. So it's it's almost an awareness into our behaviors, isn't it? Absolutely. Which I think is so beautiful. I know what it was. You hear stories of clear your clutter and clear your mind. (laughs) Yes. Well, I will just, I will answer this with a little story. So I, my home is always organized. I am an organizer. I'm supposed to, Mm -hmm. but it makes sense. (laughs) sense. It's right. It's like, you know, would you trust a, you know, uh, an accountant who couldn't do math? I don't probably not, but my house is in good shape. But when I made this decision a few months ago to move, I had to, when you pack, there's an upheaval that goes on. You're uprooting yourself from a home and you're having to, oftentimes you don't just instantly put it in a box. Sometimes you have to like sort things. And like, I always pack all my decor together, for example. So I have to like mm-hmm. gather every piece of, cause I'm not going to pack it with towels or I don't, I like gather every piece of decor. I want all the boxes of books together. I want, you know, it's like, I like to kind of pack in that way. And some people pack by room. It's fine. But there is a sense of chaos when you're moving. And there's a lot of incompletion because there's things that you're packing, but you might have to leave the box open to add more at the last minute, or it's just a very tumultuous endeavor. And I, while I was packing, was also working on this keynote speech and I was working on some client projects and I was working on, you know, a ton of new things and also moving out of state and walking through my house was just eruptive. It was, I it was hard to focus. It was hard to be calm because there was a state of upheaval. And what would happen is my brain would be doing like a task list every time I'd walk through that room. Like, oh, I have to go mm. and remember to do this and buy bubble wrap. And it's just, it was just so <laughs> intense. And so what I needed to do and what I always suggest for people is a lot of times our greatest challenges with our stuff comes from needing a clear plan. Because oftentimes that voice in our head is because it thinks we missed it the first hundred times. It's afraid we're going to miss the message. So if I stop and I write that down and I say, buy bubble wrap, it no longer needs to tell me in my brain to buy bubble wrap every time I see my figurines (laughs) because it is on a list and I can say it's on the list. I will not forget Mm. the list. So I always talk about creating a primary list for your task management, or if you have a project like a move, creating a, a like a task list for that, doing a brain dump, getting everything out of your brain and onto the paper, making sense of it. People think organizing is the physical touching of stuff and moving it and handling it. But oftentimes it starts in our head, the way we're talking Mm -hmm. about the deeper meaning of our clutter, but it can also be the planning stages. And we perceive, you know, if I'm going to get an oil change, this is a, you know, really common example, get an oil change. I don't just reach into my pantry and grab an oil change. I have to call the mechanic, make an appointment, find Mm -hmm. a time, drive down there, bring, you know, either arrange for travel back to my own home or work from a Mm -hmm. coffee shop or read a book or there's so many steps. And, and that's what derails people is the micro details of the steps. But sometimes Mm -hmm. 
the antidote is in the poison. And so the thing that feels the most stressful can be healing if we can stop and we can just brain dump everything down so that our brain doesn't feel like it needs to perpetually remind us of these things okay. because it knows we've heard it. Okay. So that's what happens when they say clear the clutter will help clear the brain just yeah. by being organized and in, in writing things down than keeping them in your right. mind. Like, and also a lot of times the things we keep are things we want to do something about. I always say, if you have a paper problem, you probably have a task problem. If you have a, an email problem, you probably have a task problem. Like it's the problem is, is that we get this stuff in our lives and we don't know what to do about it, or we're in the middle of waiting before, or we might want to do something, but we don't know mm -hmm. yet. And, you know, it's, it's this in between. And so it's this idea of how can we shift our thinking and say, how do I make this more actionable? And then getting mm -hmm. really like, if our clutter is talking to us, it wants us to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Because your bed frame is not talking to you. Your carpet is not talking to you. Your pillows are not talking to you, but your giant stack of reading material is talking to you. The papers <laughs> on your dresser are talking to you. The un, the purses that need to be emptied are talking to you. Why are those talking, but your pillows are not talking to you? It's, it's all just stuff. And so you're giving that's, me anxiety. I know, I'm so sorry. Stuff yeah. everywhere. <laughs> well, and that's what it is, right? It's, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, I'll take it back. But like, <laughs> it really is that we, we don't get anxious about all stuff. We get anxious about the stuff we perceive we need to do something about. And so you can do a couple of things. You can't do everything at once, right? But you can make a list of the things so you could say, I'm not. And then when you look at your purse that needs to be emptied, you think that's on my list. I'll handle it in the right time. Like you just retrain your brain. It's not the time to stress me out about that. Right. Yeah. And you can also choose. I think sometimes when we notice that oftentimes our physical chaos is a task problem, we can choose to take these things off of our plate and say, yes, I would love to refinish that desk. I'm not going to do it. I've had that desk for six years. I'm going to just call, you know, goodwill mm -hmm. to come and pick it up or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you are allowed, you do not have to finish things you started. You can totally cut them off and say, I release you and I no longer need to do this. Mm. And that is okay. It is, you are not failing by not finishing. In fact, sometimes you are just giving yourself more energy to move forward into your life more powerfully. Huh. Thank you. I feel so much better. After yeah, I'm so, I had to bring you home after causing an anxiety and panic attack. <laughs> oh, I could feel it. It's real. I know it's real. <laughs> I can honestly 100% say there is no clutter on my counters. <laughs> my book, there's one book I allow myself. Yeah, but just thinking about it. Yeah. Okay, so we've gotten to the root of our clutter tendencies. And good communications can heal our relationships by the sounds of it. We kind of touched on that with the couple's teacup, <laughs> just yeah. leaving it there. All right. The last one. Proof of your genius. How is my clutter in my closets my proof of my genius? That's so good. Do you want to know about your, do you mean generally, or do you want me to actually diagnose your closet? No, I'm talking generally. Okay. I she's like, get out of that. my closet, lady. Don't even think about it. Well, I've done <laughs> be amazed. So, so clutter can be proof of our genius. So, okay. So one, one thing that people don't often realize is that Albert Einstein had a very cluttered desk. He was a very cluttered person. And, and he also had this quote that said, if an empty or if a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind of what then is an empty desk a sign. Ooh. And yeah, how beautiful is that? Right. It's like very pro clutter. And I'm yeah. a big fan of it because to me, oftentimes the clutter builds up, not because we're a hot mess or we don't know what we're doing or there's something wrong with us or we're missing the organizing gene. Oftentimes our clutter is showing us that we are outgrowing the life we've been living. Mm. And if you can start to look and see, oh, wow, okay, great. This stuff is building up because I'm not doing it anymore, but I'm doing this other thing instead. If we can look at the decluttering and organizing process as releasing the things that we're departing from our lives and embracing mm -hmm. and stepping up into the foreground, the things that we are currently engaged in. If we can look at it as this is what I'm choosing to give my energy to, this is where I'm growing and expanding in my life. If we can do that, I mean, that changes the frame completely. And that's where our genius 
Yeah. Your growth. Yeah. Your growth, the things you're curious about. Like, so if you go into someone's home that has stacks and stacks of stuff, ask them something about something in their Mm -hmm. clutter. Like, Oh, tell me about, wow, you seem really into magazines. Tell me about that. And they might go Mm -hmm. off in this direction of how they really love, you know, the idea of renovating their home and they've been working on it for years and they're so excited about it. And they love this particular designer and they can't wait to hire like you will go down a rabbit hole with them if you get curious because those magazines are there to help them be creative. Oh, that was the other, that was the fifth way that we, sorry, my tree distracted me. The fifth way we use our clutter is for creativity. So a lot of times you'll see the physical stuff around us are the next chapters of our lives being born and brought into creation. Okay. Oh my goodness. I gotta have you back because I've got popcorns. (laughs) Tinging <laughs> of all the Yay. places I wanted us to go, but I think we're out of time. I've no idea. I know you've got something else after this, so I won't keep you. What an interesting way of looking at our clutter. So don't get down on ourselves, get curious. Yeah, get Ask curious. Questions. And- yeah, and start to dig into what what your clutter might be doing for you. And one of the things that I'd love to share with your listeners, Anne, is um, I'm happy to gift them a free copy of my book if they go to starhansen.com forward slash podcast, and they can download a free copy there. They can kind of explore some resources. But what can be really helpful, because this is a big game changer for the conversation of clutter, it can take a little bit to wrap your brain around it. Yeah. And so them going through that, but it's a very easy, easy to read, very conversational. All the main points are in there. The 10 steps are in there, the ways that you use your clutter in there. And it can be so helpful to just like, you know, read this, explore it, start to see how does it appeal to you? How does it resonate for you? And, and start to see for yourself. So if you're, if your listeners want to download it, they can get it at starhansen.com forward slash podcast. Oh, what a lovely gift. Thank you so very much. And I'm sure a number of my uh, grief clients would probably also like it when they get to that stage of having to sort through their loved one's belongings, what to keep and what not to keep. And that's a, a whole other podcast for another day. Star, I will make sure all your links are in the show notes. I believe I've got most of them, but you've given a star hansen podcast yeah. podcast that they can get a free copy of them. thank you that's a very beautiful and generous offer thank you thank, so very oh, much oh thank you for having me today it was really lovely to chat with you today Anne. oh i'm honored my pleasure wow <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna go before i go down another rabbit hole with you <laughs> all the very best with your move and let me know where you settle Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Well, listeners, that is indeed a wrap. And I do hope you feel a little bit more comforted when you look around your house. And please, no blame. Just get curious. Thanks so much, everyone. Until next time. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Star. Oh, thank you. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.